So and then the the SR came back. It had had been there for like ten years. Right. Uh, it was kind of a it was a a YF twelve actually, but hmm. they they um, they flew it looking at aerodynamic heating, and the beginnings of digital fly by, fly by wire. Eventually, the SR was converted to digital, the flight control system. But they were clever enough not to mess with it. They virtually duplicated it. Didn't go and have to retest things too much. So it it, it improved the range by about 7% because mm -hmm. they could control the inlets very much more accurately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How many came back? Because you sent me a PowerPoint presentation that I was able to watch before this uh, discussion today and it's got embedded videos and I see you flying which is fun but it was the one with like the little piggyback That's, yeah. canopy on top we, of the we got now when I was there we got three airplanes wow. we got two A models and a B model and when they uh, that's when the Air Force retired the SR the first time in the 91 they um, they had decided to it was a SAC was running that you know that they Strategic had, Air Command? They needed, yeah, they needed money. They wanted money for other projects, I guess, but okay. they uh, they retired it, but then they brought it back, uh, and they actually reconstituted the debt at Edwards. Hmm. So um, we got three airplanes. But the B model, when the Defense Department agreed to give three to NASA, they the B model was in pieces at in its big inspections, that happened, I don't know, every 10 years or whatever, uh, at Palmdale. So then I actually saw the memo written by Cheney directing them to get the, the B model back together and flying to deliver to NASA. Oh, wow. But that's the B model. The B model was a cockpit that you could fly from in the back. Okay. But the canopy was what sat above. They, had, they put an additional canopy that with the spacesuit helmet on, you could fit in there. You, you, you'd <laughs> look out, you could fit in there, but if there was an on-start, which occasionally happened, mm -hmm. you'd actually bang your head against the, wow. the wall. Uh, when, what was it like, actually is the way I want to ask this, when it s seemed that this aircraft was coming back and you would have a chance to fly it? I mean, I, I have to think, of course, you've had some amazing experiences by this point, but was that a pinch me moment or oh, sure. was it just, okay. It was a... <laughs> An unexpected moment, yeah. And of course, I was assigned assigned two pilots to each project. So the Steve Eshmael was had been there a while, long, a lot longer than I had, and myself were assigned as the SR pilots. That was a real plum in the office um, for me, and uh, I certainly appreciated that. Yeah. And the same man that hired me was the one making those decisions. So yeah, it was a big deal, and um, we had a chance. We, the people that were going to fly, to go. The simulator that was at Beale, and Rod Dykeman was the squadron commander at that time at Beale. They were still they were starting to wind down now. Well, they, he had now he worked for American Airlines. He had left when they disbanded the SR and joined American. And so anyway, he though his last thing in the Air Force went to the Binghamton, I think it was in New York, to accept the modified simulator. The simulator was. Ah brought up to date and uh, it was a really an excellent simulator with visual and small motion wow. separated cockpits in the back seat or you could fly just with an instructor behind you and so he he was there and met us and then he ultimately was working for american when we got the b model when we were ready to start flying he wrote nasa and volunteered he said i'll take time off from from American three weeks, <laughs> and I'll come and, yeah. and check out Steve, the first guy. Okay. And he did that, and he annotated every page of the Dash 1 with hand notes. This is really important. Forget about this. And the Dash matter. 1 is the manual. The manual, I'm right. sorry, the yeah, flight right. manual, yeah. And he did all that. He flew, a, I didn't fly with him. Maybe I flew in the simulator with him, but he flew with Steve and checked him out. And then I made the first flight my first flight with Steve Ishmael, uh, which we had a a non-start. Right on the first at, flight. On the first flight. Oh gosh, it scared the crap out of us. Raj, when I don't know if this is an easy uh, way to quantify, but let's say at some point in your day at, at work, you say, "Okay, I need to start studying to learn to fly the SRS-71." So if you imagine you start the clock there, 
How long does it take before you actually get into an SR-71 and go fly? Yeah, I, I think a month. Like a month? We, yeah, we, wow. we had a simulator and, okay. and so on. So yeah. you could study the systems, learn the procedures, start up and shut down in emergencies, yeah, yeah. get in the simulator a whole bunch, and a month later you could go fly Yeah, maybe two months. I wow. don't know. Yeah, a month, a month yeah. or two months. Wow. Not long. But, of course, you're not a brand-new pilot. <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> you're right. But they made sure that you – uh, you were ready, right. you know. They, but they didn't send you to class exactly the same as you might in a, a new guy. But, right. Yeah. Wow. And that. So how many hours or flights or what? I, I flew um, eight years. Wow. But uh, we didn't fly a, a lot. I, I flew 150 hours roughly in the SR in that time. Okay. Yeah. So I we also when the Air Force reactivated the program at Edwards. We, myself, by this time, Steve Ishmael had left that flying the SR and Ed Schneider took over and I was the prime pilot. And so then we we work with the Air Force, reconstituted the program, but they had no instructors in uh, 94, 95 time period. So they came and annotated, you know, annotated. They <laughs> they anointed you. Ah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're an instructor pilot. I was in a, wow. both, we were, official instructor pilots for the Air Force. So the first guy I flew with had 900 hours, but he hadn't flown for like eight years. Okay. So, and I keep asking him, what'd you just say? Because he, I <laughs> take notes, I was taking <laughs> notes. So we had a, a good relationship. They, f yeah. they then flew the B model. Okay. And they, they, they then got an A model. Right. The, the second A model that we had, they started flying. Well, but. Right? I mean, all these aircraft, where were they in, in all that time? In some sort of level 1,000, I think you call it, preservation somewhere? or Yeah, we had the two A models sitting in our ramp, but we flew the A model and the B model right. regularly. But when the Air Force was getting back into it, were they going to bring some out of? We got, we had a crew that were proficient at maintenance on the SR. Okay. We were cleared to fly it then, and mm -hmm. we flew it to Palmdale, and they, they, Reinspected the airplane okay. thoroughly and then turned it back to the Air Force. Uh, the likely we flew it back yeah. and landed it, and they took it over. Yeah. Okay. And NASA's role in this was it also partly for? I think you had said you did some research. It was it. This, yeah, they the they did a lot of research for the. Uh, th there was quite a lot of for several years a uh, um, idea to take a vehicle, take it off, and fly it to space, uh, and then it sort of impractical to you could have thought about it beforehand that the amount of fuel you have to carry and the size you have to so that that was part of the doing data flights for that we did some oddball data flights for people carrying simulating a satellite going by because our going at Mach 3.2 across you know Phoenix uh, is like some of these satellite <laughs> things it's like a satellite going by so mm -hmm. We checked out some systems like that. Uh, and then the laser was a new type of rocket engine that had never been flown. If you look at pictures of space planes and see them, the, you look at like the, uh, the exhaust looks like a rectangle. Okay. Uh -huh. It's got slices. Each one of those slices could be a laser, a rocket engine with its, the thing about a laser was it only had one side of the nozzle, the other side was the air at the Mach number you're at itself compensating. You're saying the word laser. Are we thinking like a no kidding light laser? No, like it's, I, I'm sorry. That's an acronym. Okay. It's linear aerospike rocket engine. Uh, okay. Sorry. No, that's all right. Um, and we flew, uh, we tried to fly for a couple of several years. Uh, we had Lockheed Skunk Works um, make a 1,500-pound canoe, if you like, that sat on the attached to the top of the SR, blanked out the drag chute, for example. Hmm. But it carried the tanks for gaseous hydrogen and liquid oxygen, and we had a tenth scale model of one slice of a laser uh, mounted on a fin in, the, in between the two tails. And the idea was we were going to do a seven second burn uh, to demonstrate for the first time in flight a laser actually ignited. So we had that done at the Skunk Works. At the time, the head of NASA was championing this better, faster, cheaper thing, which you can't have all of them. That's right. <laughs> and so um, they didn't use the, the valves that were the latest and most expensive ones. 
So we had, um, we got the airplane and then it was leaking. You can identify oxygen leaks pretty easily. At least they have, they have sensors that can do that. Mm -hmm. Hydrogen stuff, because it's just a tiny model, a tiny atom, you know. And so we did a lot of work trying to get the leaks down and we kind of succeeded in that, in the oxygen side. But you can't do it with the hydrogen, there were no sensors to do that. And we went through many safety boards, and we had people on the boards, or not on the board, but you talk to people about rockets, and they come from Huntsville, and they're used to something goes wrong, they blow it up or something. <laughs> and they, I, one guy said to me once when we were debating something about this, and uh, he said, well, what's the big deal? You know, at the worst case, it can be just a small hydrogen fire. I, don't th I said, I don't think those two words go together. Plus, we're 20 <laughs> feet ahead of where that fire right. is, and you can't just press a button. So it, ultimately, the safety board, uh, the director retired, and uh, he might have had a different view. The crew was convinced that it was the risk was not great for seven-second burn and so on, mm. of having simultaneous leaks right together. Yeah. But we never got clearance, so we failed. Mm. That's the only time we ever failed in a project. Oh, wow. Yeah, we failed in the laser, yeah. Didn't fly it. We had a whole a whole episode. We on, flew it, but you flew it, but, but we never really ignited, ignited it. Yeah. yeah, we had a whole episode on the SR seventy one with Brian Shaw, who actually passed away recently. Yes, and yeah. he was quick to give credit to Kelly Johnson and the team and all the folks that made that aircraft happen. But he uh, he liked to relate it, as I recall, to like a fifty seven Chevy, and it's just pure and and plain and not a lot of. Uh, thrill or frills maybe, but I want to ask you, when it was starting to come back, now we are here what, in the 90s, I believe, was there an urge, or maybe there was an actual effort to, well, we can upgrade the cockpit, or we can fill in these leaks, or we can change the fuel, because I think the JP, was it seven, eight, eight yeah. was uh, a challenge. So when it came back, were there people that were championing that, or was it just, no, take it as it is, because it's too much money to try to do to anything else? Yeah, well, they, they did go through the business of changing the flight controls to digital. Okay. Not just the flight controls, but then inlet controls. And and that was a big a big effort. Okay. And, but I'm, uh, he just recently passed away and I was, they, when I asked the SR people, I never met him, but they look at me and say he was a great storyteller. Uh, but but you, you think uh, of if if you see there's on um, YouTube there's um, uh, an 18 minute video uh, called the the insane engineering of the SR 71. It's animated. It's terrific. It's mm. really well done. But you think of that engine, how it functions. You would not think of 57 shells. Yeah, it, it is an amazing accomplishment to be a turbo ramjet, and that's the spike moved 26 inches. Mm -hmm. You know, and yes, you had to be, that's 26 inches in an environment where the temperatures were like 600 degrees or higher Southeast. in the inlet. Yeah. And the impact temperatures, that's what kept, you know, that's what limited the speed yeah. was temperature. So nowadays we have new materials. So when you talk about doing some things at high speed, you have materials that can, it's not easy, but yeah. it's not outlandish with the materials we have. But the SR, that's why it had titanium structure. Right. Because at 3.2 Mach, aluminum would melt. Yeah. And they had to invent the tooling to make the aircraft oh, yeah. out of all that. That's you know they have a, one of those engines at the San Diego Air and Space? No, I, I think I heard that. Yeah, it's yeah. downstairs. Uh, our videographer, Kevin, over here, and I got a chance to see it when we were talking to them about the episode that we did with them. So but, it was know, neat. It was huge. Yeah, and uh, I mean, uh, they're cool. The fuel is a coolant. It goes through the whole airplane. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think that's a good description of it. But it, it didn't, it, it functioned. It didn't have a lot of. There were some problems. We had one that, that we had an emergency at Oshkosh, uh, refueling over the lake that I was involved in. Uh, that the there was a, the nozzles were pressure. The pressure in the nozzle the medium that was in it wasn't hydraulic fluid, it was fuel. So what happened was one of the lines, there was a small little pump that changed it to 3,000 PSI. And one of that, got it got out of balance and it cracked 
the small line that went to the nozzle. Oh gosh! So then it was spewing fuel right throughout the uh, out the nozzle, and we were very close to uh, coming back to Edwards. We were over the lake, and I had I had told one of our guys that was taking an F-18 there to be on static display. Why don't you fly fly with us? You know, give you something to do as well. Mm -hmm. And it was good that he did because it was a tanker from Edwards. They knew us, and uh, but the the tanker guy kept saying, you, you know, there's some there's a lot of stuff coming out your left uh, exhaust, and we were getting clearances. The guy in the back was talking to clearances, and we were going to fly by supersonic, you know, high up, but we were going to transition right over Oshkosh. And so then I said, come on, why don't you come over this side and have a look? Tell me what you see. Mm -hmm. So he got over there and he said, boy, there's a lot of, a lot of something coming out of the <laughs> left nozzle was fuel that was pouring. If we'd lit the afterburner, I'm sure bad things would have happened. Uh, so we declared an emergency and had to dump 60,000 pounds of gas oops. over the lake. And, <laughs> and then we, we landed, and I'm talking, at the back seater was going, oh, don't shut the engine down. And I'm saying, well, the checklist says, and I said, okay, we're going to shut it down at 15,000 feet coming down. So we did. So we're straight in, shut it on one engine. And then I, I said to the tower, the chase is going to land in front of us and clear the runway. You know, so Is this in Oshkosh? You're landing there? No, no. We're, okay. we're landing in Milwaukee. Sorry. All right, all right. So we declared an emergency and we went into Milwaukee. Okay. And so he said, I don't know what you said, but you're clear to do anything you want. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we did that and we landed okay. But all right. Uh, the tanker also landed, and our crew chief was in there. And they, well, after we got out of the suits, they opened the panel, and this line was broken at both ends. Yeah. Now, so we were lucky that. It but didn't. if you just land in a place that's not expecting you, like Milwaukee, you're dressed like an astronaut. Can you get yourself out of that, no. or you just, you just yeah, sit in it until? <laughs> yeah. Until someone comes to help you. Well, the back seater had the pins. We further we have to pin the gear before we shut the engine down. Oh. That, that's just in that's case there's some protocol. Yeah, it's wow. protocol. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. the checklist. So he had the pins. So he had to get out, and the fireman had a ladder off the back end. <laughs> so I'm watching him, but the first thing he has to do is get out of his suit. Then he's in his long underwear. And and so there, the long underwear is a, is modified so it takes care of all that you need to take with mm -hmm. you. And, and that you can imagine that you have a little bottle in your leg and how it gets there. But So I'm looking at him, and he's getting out of the suit. A uh, lady happened to be helping him. Uh, and, a, and the garden reserve is there. So they were of great help. Oh, good. So he, he gets his suit on. Now he's holding the pins in one hand. He's holding his underwear across <laughs> the <laughs> hole in the front. And, and he's walking, and there's a puddle of fuel around the airplane. Ooh. You know, so I, and he's in his stocking feet. And I'm looking at him. I wonder how he's going to do this. Well, he went back and got his boots on, but he had to trump through this gas and put that in. So that was the amusing <laughs> side of what could have been a disaster.